Shalom, everyone. I'm Stephen Bendenen with the Noonan Institute of Biblical Research. I want to take a little time with you today to speak to you about the Hanukkah story, but in a way that perhaps you've never really thought of Hanukkah before. It is a message of restoration. It is a message of God uniting with His people, with God bringing both men and women together in one with Him, and uh, a completion, a unit. It's, it's a message of restoration from the from very beginning even until the end. And I've been troubled for several days as far as how to present the Hanukkah message to you guys because I've just felt every time I would start, the Lord was not happy. He was not pleased with what I was about to say. Um, and of course, I seem to keep getting sick here lately. So uh, again, my throat is irritated from a lot of sinus issues here. <clears throat> so please just bear with me. But those of you that know, let me just give you a little rough background of the story of Hanukkah so that you can understand where we're going to go from. The true story behind Hanukkah, it is more than the Maccabee brothers overcoming um the uh, Antiochus IV of Epiphanes, which Epiphanes means that he was God in human form, uh, who had the Greeks that had conquered Israel and were ruling over the, the Jewish people. Unfortunately, at Israel's own invitation, much like Israel has invited Rome uh, to, to enter into this dialogue concept in Israel. And of course, later the Romans conquered the, the Greeks, um, and the Syrians, and so uh, we, we're starting to see history play itself out on the stage today in Israel, uh, the Romans and behind the scenes. Of course, Rome ruled Israel up until the time of the destruction of the Second Temple. Anyway, the Maccabee brothers, Judah Maccabee, um, him and his brothers carried out a courageous victory against the largest army in the world, the Greek army uh, combined with the Syrian army, and they were outnumbered 100 to 1. But they overcame by the grace of God, and they took Jerusalem back, and the temple was rededicated. Now, oddly enough, in the book of Maccabees, we do not see the dedication uh, of the temple of the menorah lights. It's actually in another book written uh, about this, these lights and how that um, the, the Greeks had defiled all the temple oil. But there was one cruise of oil that was found that had not been defiled. And that cruise was only to last one day of burning of the menorah. <clears throat> but oddly enough, it lasted for eight days. Now, I personally don't find that strange at all. Because the one cruise of oil clearly represents that God would embody that light, that, that Shekinah glory would be embodied in a menorah. Now, Keep in mind, as I go through this message, it's going to be a message of restoration. It's, it's, a, it's a message that both brethren and sisters really should pay close attention to, uh, or ladies and gentlemen, whichever the case may be. Maybe you are listening to the first time, you're not a believer in Yeshua. But if you're not, and you're a, a, a lady, and uh, you would like to know that God looks at you in the same light as He would a man, that's exactly what you're going to find out today. Maybe in a deeper way than you've ever imagined before. I know I'm not popular for doing these types of messages. I know many people, not just brothers, but even sisters, get a little upset about some of the things that I've been saying recently um, about the equality that God sees in both men and women. But you have to remember, God doesn't look at us, look at us as a gender so anyway, before I get into that, let's, let's set the whole stage so you understand. You have to remember, we fell together. Adam and Eve fell together from grace, and Christ came to redeem them both. Uh, so there's the idea that women are saved because they birthed children is totally baseless. It's not scriptural. It's, of course, there's a mistranslation that makes it appear that way, but even women know that they're not saved because they have babies. What about a woman that's barren? Is she saved because uh, she lost and goes to hell because she can't produce children? No. We'll go into that a little bit later. So straighten all these 
false doctrines out as we go along here. Anyway, so in the story of Hanukkah, that one cruise of oil lasted eight days. Now that cruise of oil represented a scripture, a beautiful scripture I spoke to you guys about recently that you would find in the book of 2 Chronicles, the 21st chapter. Let me just read to you in English for you at first. I want to also read it into the Hebrew language. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as did the house of Ahab. And for he had the daughter of Ahab to, to wife, and he's talking about Jehoram. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. See? Shows that a man can be just as bad as wicked as anybody. It doesn't matter. If you do not have that life of Christ in you, you know, you might be a good person outwardly, seeming to be a pretty good guy, good girl, whatever the case may be, but there's, it's important to have his life in you. Howbeit the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David as he had promised to give him a lamp to him and to his children always. Now, in some places, that's translated as a light. The word is nia in Hebrew. So he says uh, in Hebrew, Okay. Uh, so, and that would be literally all, all the days, all, all, all their days. So that nia in, in Hebrew, it's also translated as light. And the reason it's translated as light is because it, it's not like or. Or in Hebrew means light. But this light here is a light that has been placed into a vessel, such as a menorah. It's one reason why we translate it as lamp. But it's a homonym, as I've mentioned to you before. A homonym is a word spelled exactly the same, sounds the same, but has a different meaning. And the other meaning for nia is to break up or to, like, plowing up a field. But they work hand in hand together. Because when Yeshua, that is Jesus, when he came, he had to break up the fallow ground, the hard ground, the hardness of the heart of Israel, in order that they might be able to receive the light. Now, Hanukkah, though, is clearly depict, depicts the coming of Christ. It comes and shows that all of the other oils all the other vessels of oil that was in Israel were contaminated. But there would come one vessel that would not be contaminated. That vessel would be, or that cruise of oil would be the Spirit of the God. This, of course, we know oil represents the Holy Spirit. And when that oil was poured into those, that menorah, the seven lampstand menorah, it burned miraculously for eight days something that was only supposed to last a single day. That's where the miracle is. And see, the, it's interesting to say that because Christ's eight days actually represents eternity. There's only seven days in a week. By the way, that's something else. One day we're gonna, I want to take the time to take you through the Gregorian calendar and your days of the week and stuff like that. I know we typically use that because the fact the world goes by a Gregorian calendar, but if you only knew some of the things that it means, like, like for example, you just give you a little example there. The month of August, that's for Augustus. Uh, the month of July, that's for Julius Caesar. Every month has something to do with a pagan uh, history behind it. Same thing with the days of the week, Sunday. Sunday for the sun god worship, the solace there. Uh, and, of course, we, it goes on and on and on. Not like the Hebrew calendar where it is Yom Rishon, first day. Uh, Yom Shenei, second day. Yom Shlishi, third day. Yom Ravi, fourth day. Yom, um, uh, gosh, my brain has kind of stopped here too much here. Uh, Yom Shishi, you know, the fifth day. Chamishi, uh, excuse me. And then Yom Shishi and Yom Shabbat would be in the seventh day. Anyway. So the menorah, that light that was contained in the menorah would be the light, would be a light in a vessel. It'd be a supernatural light. That's one reason why the candle was able to burn for the eight days. Now we're going to go deeper. All right. I want to take you because 
If you're ever going to understand redemption, you've got to understand the beginning. And I've taught this as much as I know how. And I wanted to share with you, and some people may not like this, but I'd like to share it with you anyway, because I'm always interested in trying to understand um, what authentications do we have. I know there's so many people that claim that there's this book and that book out there um, that should have been canonized as part of the Bible. Well, I can't say yay or nay, they should or should not have, but I do find sometimes them very fascinating, especially when you see things like quotes in the Bible that quote or mention sources of other books. I mean, even in the book of Chronicles, the book of Nathan is mentioned, the book of Asa, the book, book of uh, Gad, Gath is, the prophet Gad is mentioned. And even in the uh, New Testament, it speaks about uh, quotes that are, they say are found in the book of Enoch. Now, I do question sometimes, you know, the authenticity of the translations or the sources of where they come from. But I happened to be reading the book of Thomas recently. And, um, and I, I kind of, I like a lot of the things uh, that have been discovered about it because of where it was discovered, when it was discovered, what scholars have actually said about this book. Um, it has been stated by scholars in more recent times that it is considered the oldest um, writings of the Gospels, of any, even of the four that were canonized in the Scripture. Now, keep in mind, there's a reason why I look into the authenticity of these things. And i got a good friend of mine, David Roll. Um, we've known each other, not per, in person, but we've known each other for, for quite some time. I've written about David in his work, uh, uh, Kings and Pharaohs, because his work, although David is not, I would say, I don't think David is a, um, he's not a full believer in the Bible. I shouldn't say that, but I don't want to say he's not because I don't really know David's personal views on that. But David is an Egyptologist, historian, and archaeologist. And uh, I even wrote David recently. We've been communicating back and forth a little bit about this subject because Although we may not agree on everything, we certainly, he's going to, he's only going to tell you what he believes as far as factual information, and I appreciate that. And we talk about what are books that are canonized, what, you know, how this works out. David's a little bit more brash about that, but uh, nonetheless, um, we can look at the, uh, the possibility. Now, when we look at the canonizing of the Bible that we have today, uh, there were many books that were not permitted to be in the Bible because of whatever political move was going on. Because you have to remember, back then, the Caesar, who had, had, had united uh, church and state, uh, he had brought together what he called the leading authorities of that time of, of, uh, at the Nicaea Council of 325. So there was a lot of political influence of what books they would allow in and what they would not allow in. Just as I've mentioned to you before, there's other books, uh, even like the book of Hebrews. There's a lot of suggestion from scholars that it's not written by Paul at all, that it actually has a woman author. Uh, there is uh, documented evidence that uh, there was a woman apostle written in the very Bible you have now, um, Junia, that uh, was her name was a female name up into the 11th century. You can find it in any of the, uh, the ancient uh, text from before the 11th century. It was a woman apostle, but the Vatican changed that. So I'm always interested in what truth is. I'm not interested in fantasy or, or things of that nature. And what really drives me to it is probably the, the, the purest text of Bible that you will have is what you call your Old Testament. It is the Hebrew Scriptures. The Jewish people have been more faithful at preserving the Old Testament. Uh, and when the Christian writers, the apostles, uh, and some of them were women apostles, it's clearly written in a lot of these uh, ancient scrolls and stuff, there was a lot of debate as to what they would allow in there. It's kind of hard for them to pull it over on the Jews. The Jews had been maintaining their Bible all the way down through, and they maintained it even afterwards. Uh, even in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, there are accounts found in there uh, as well that are very interesting to see. But the book of Thomas was a book that was found in northern Egypt. And a lot of scholars have uh, confirmed the authenticity of what was discovered. 
And to date, it's the oldest manuscript they have found, even older than the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So, but anyway, I'm not going to canonize this or that or say yay or nay as far as that, but what I wanted to do is share with you something that um, was written there in this book. They just do it as one chapter. There's, I think, about 118 verses to it. But he says here in, in verse 18, the disciples said to Jesus, tell us how our end will be. And Jesus said, according to Thomas's gospel, have you ever discovered that then, excuse me, have you discovered then the beginning that you look for the end? For where the beginning is, there will be, there will the end be. Blessed is he who will take his place in the beginning. He will know the end and will not experience death. Now, there are several things that I read there that struck my heart because even though I had never read some of these writings, I began to realize the things that God had already dealt with me on was exactly the same thing that Thomas had wrote because that's what the Lord had showed me as well. Everything lays in the beginning. And if you don't get the beginning, you'll never understand the end, neither your own end. It's also where the new birth comes in. You have to understand the beginning. And when you can understand the beginning, then you can, <laughs> then you begin to realize what it takes for the end. So I want to take you back to Genesis in chapter 1. And I wanted to share with you again the first four verses there. Let's read it in the original. Let's go back to the first. Read it that way, and then we'll read it in English. Okay. Now, in English, it says, In the beginning, or at the first, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, the earth was... Um, by the way, it's not heaven. I know that's the way it is in King James. It actually says heavens in Hebrew. The heavens and, and the, the earth. Earth is singular, though, but the heavens are plural. Uh, now, the earth was unformed and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. You remember, that's one of the reasons why I mentioned about uh, Yeshua, Jesus, when he walked on the waters of the, of the Sea of Galilee. It's only showing that he was God manifested in a human body, standing there walking on the face of the deep, uh, even back at the beginning of time. Now, please understand, don't miss mistake me for thinking that I am a oneness. I'm not a oneness at all. I believe that God has manifested himself according to his own desire. And it's, it is a tremendous mystery, far beyond even that I can figure out. All I can do is see what God has shows me and share those things with you. But I'm not oneness because Jesus is not his own father. So clearly, I understand that. So I just want to make sure you understand that as well. There's a lot of critics out there say all kinds of things. I don't pay much attention because I realize that even the critics don't really know what God has put in my own heart. And so I realize if they don't understand that, why well, try to correct them? They just don't understand. So anyway, as he looks at this here, he says, The Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. Now, the word let there be is a, not a good way to translate that. Yahi. Yahi is eternity coming into existence. It is God making himself manifest in a way, in a form in which he can have fellowship with his own creation. Not to mention, so he can create his creation. Let me put it like that. Maybe that'll make more sense. So he says, uh, uh, the, uh, and there was light, or the light was existing now. And God saw the light that it was good. We've got to remember, God 
God himself, who is the source of, of the, God is the source of Christ. We should say it like that there. And Christ is the one that created everything. Everything that exists, anything that we can see, the heavens, earth, everything created by him and for him. Okay, so that's a little deep in saying that, but it is. That's what he did. All right. Now, he saw that the light was good and he separated. All right. Now, you have in here, and God divided the light from the darkness. See, bain, uh, bain ha'or uvein ha'oshet. Now, nachash is the word for uh, serpent, and the serpent is darkness to begin with. He's a creature of darkness, and God put a separation between the two. Now, it goes into the lunar aspect of it after that, and it talks about, you know, he, the morning and the day, et cetera, and the night. He separated, you know, showing that there. But the actual creation of that light is speaking of Christ. Now, how do we know that for sure? You might say, well, brother, see, that's just your opinion. In John 1, chapter 1, verse 4, now we know in the first verse, as in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God and made manifest, or made flesh, excuse me. Um, and so we can't ar argue that. Uh, but it says in verse 4, in him was life. In who? In the Word, which was Christ. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Mm. I could take you into some writings and things that have not been canonized in the Bible that would make you understand this better. And I, I don't know if you could handle that as of yet, so maybe I won't go into that as of yet. But let me just say like this, though, so you will understand. In him was life. Life is what in Hebrew? Chaim. All right? In him was life. Chaim. In the garden, there is a tree of life. Eitz Chaim. There is a tree of knowledge of good and evil. See? Uh, uh, I'm having a hard time swallowing here. Sorry about that. Uh, but anyway, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, the funny thing is, is that tree of knowledge of good and evil has been here the entire time. It never left. And you choose whether or not you want to partake of it to this day. You're no different than Adam and Eve. In fact, since Yeshua came along, you now have both trees at your disposal. Both trees, I shouldn't say disposal, but both trees, you can partake of one or the other. And depending on which one you partake of, depends on whether you live or you die. Well, that's a lot to think about, but it's just the same. Anyway, in him was life, so he was the tree of life. It's Chaim. And the life was the light of men. How do we know that? Well, you remember in Genesis when God created Adam? Let's look at that. Let me just pull that up for you here. I want to pull it up in Hebrew because it's important that you understand some things behind this. Um, but anyway, he was the life. Um, he is the life, but when he created Adam... In the beginning, and I believe that's in chapter 2 of Genesis here. Let me just scroll down here and find it here. Uh, okay. Yes, right here. Be'yatsar, Yahweh, Elohim et ha'adam afar min ha'adamah. Okay, and then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And Okay, and this is the next part. And he breathes in his nostrils the very breath of life, the Chaim. Now, what does it say? And it was so the man. He became a living soul. Do you know what God called that man in the beginning? He doesn't call him Adam. He calls him Ish. That's spelled Aleph Yod Shin. Now that Yod in the middle is the first letter to God's divine name. If you take and remove the, the Yod, you have Aleph Shin, Ish, which is fire in Hebrew. The Yod represents that God 
It's a portion, it's a, it's a little drop of the elf. Anyway, so he puts out there, he says, verse 8, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. What a powerful statement, powerful statement in itself. Um, now, so let me say this then, in light of these things, unless we receive that light within us, Christ himself, the hope of our salvation, then we're just going to be lost. Now, I want to take you back to Ephesians. And I bring this out. The reason I'm bringing this out, because, brothers, you have to understand, too, the, the, the women in this world, just like the men, we, we have all come short of the glory of God, and, and, and we've all sinned, we've all failed, we've all made mistakes. And it's going to take the same sacrifice that God made on our behalf was for women and for men. We both equally fell. We both have to equally be redeemed. Now, I personally believe that Mary corrected the mistake that Eve made by believing God wholeheartedly. And that caused Christ to form within herself. Now, she did receive that life separately besides that of her own on the day of Pentecost. So the baby forming in her womb is not the same. But the thing is, is believing God's word produced the second Adam. Man couldn't do it. That's why God said that he'd put enmity, hatred between the woman and between the, uh, between the woman and the serpent and between her seed and the, and the serpent's seed. See, there's hatred towards women by the devil. The serpent we know is the devil. The devil hates women. He always has. And so many preachers are so deluded into thinking that women are some kind of bad, evil thing out there that tempt men and lead men astray and everything. You know, the thing is, you just haven't conquered your own lust. If you'd quit looking at women as uh, being some object, I know the world portrays her as a sex object, unfortunately. I hate to see that, but it's so. All these stores out here, they have the... Uh, sexual clothes and everything to, to try to make her, um, when I say the sexual, I'm talking about these, these stores that show women in their underwear and their lingerie and stuff like that. See, it's because men have made her to be that. She's your sister. You're her brother. You're to treat her as, as a lady. And with love and with dignity and with respect, not as if she's some uh, side of beef or something. What's wrong with you men to do stuff like that? It's shame on you for thinking like that. Do you realize that when you truly begin to recognize who Christ is and let that life, that light of God come inside of you, you should not even see her as no more than your sister. You know, you should honor her if she's your wife. Christ didn't look upon men and women as gender, uh, you know, this, like that and everything. We clearly see that from the Gospels. I mean, there are some like Peter. Peter, he was still that legalistic way, but not Paul. I know they've mistranslated his writings, and this is one of them right here in Ephesians. Let me first take you down here to Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse 32. Paul says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. A great mystery. What's a great mystery? Well, it's the part up here that he speaks about before that. When you begin over here at verse 21, where he says here, let me just start at verse 18. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God 
and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. That word submitting yourself is from hupotosomai. It's got a middle voice, something we don't have in English, but there's a middle voice in that. And what that is, that's, that's uh, a, a, a willfulness to submit to one another. A mutual submission, you might call it. Now, it says here, it's funny, they didn't put it in italics here, but they should have, because in the original Greek, verse 22, just in the original Greek, it literally says, wives unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. Never says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Because God, had, you know, Paul had already, excuse me, Paul had already addressed that. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You understand? That's a mutual submission that they have one to another that they should have. But the, the, the translators added that in there. They just assume because why? They're from a patriarchal way of thinking. But remember now, Paul's saying this is a great mystery. So we need to see what he means by this so we understand. All right, verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife. Now, I mentioned to you a little while back that word kephale. There's not any Greek scholar that they can come up with that in, in, in some of the most ancient of writings that have ever translated that any other way but source. Some of the ancient dictionaries, I'm not talking about your modern dictionaries, but where the uh, churches and the seminaries now want to make it look like he had like it's a boss. Let me tell you something. If he's talking about that the husband is the boss of the wife and, the, and, and, and Christ is the boss of the church, there's no mystery in that. Where's the mystery in that? I mean, if it's just authoritative scripture, then there's no mystery. Yeah, that's what you want to keep in mind. So let's look at that. For the husband is the source of the wife, not, the, not boss, even as Christ is the uh, source of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Well, if he's the savior of the body, then it has to be source because if it's just boss, if, in other words, if we were to translate it the way you want to say it, the way you're trying to translate it in the English way of thinking, you wouldn't say the husband is the head of the wife. You'd say the husband is the boss of the wife and Christ is the boss of the church and he is the savior of the body. What does the savior of the body got anything to do with being the boss of the church? Boss is just a boss. That's not what he said. Brother, do you not understand? If he's, if he, right, let's, let's read the rest of it before I say this here. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, what is Christ talking about dying for the church? And yet at the same time, you want to make this into a boss issue that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even the Lord the church." For ye are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Hmm. Now you can understand why it's talking about submit yourself one to another, as in a mutual submission. How could you be one flesh? How can you be, how can you fulfill the because he's quoting here from the Old Testament, how can you be uh, leave your uh, father and mother and cleave to your to your husband and wife? How can y'all cleave one to another? How can you join be joined to your wife like that, and yet be the boss? If you're the boss, you're not joined. A boss is never joined to his uh, slave. He's not one with the slave. He's authoritative and dictative. He's not joined. So it's not possible to be joined in that case. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Christ did not come down here to be a, a, a boss on us. 
He come down because he loved us to redeem us. Both men and women. And the only way that a woman can be redeemed back as well is to be one with Christ. So when he talks about, especially when he quotes from, from the Old Testament there, and he says, you know, the father and the mother and shall leave your father and mother and shall be joined into his wife and they too shall be one flesh. That's important. Because unless you be one mind, one flesh, one with Christ, you will not see that redemption. You have to remember, why does he say that these two become one? Because in the beginning, Adam, the man, was one with both female and male in him. And that's when God put that life of the light of the word within him. And both of them were filled with that life, that light of God, that fire of God. So anyway, so therefore, this kephale has nothing to do with authority or headship. It's source. Now, there was something else on my mind I wanted to share with you uh, in regards to this as well, but it kind of slips me just for the moment here. Um, let me look at my notes here for you. Let me take you also to John 12 and verse 36. While you have light, believe in the light that you may be the children of the light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. Also, Paul, he saw the same thing about the light. When he's in Acts 26, 16, he says, But rise and stand upon thy feet, this Lord speaking to him, Jesus, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn to them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So every, everywhere that, that light is there. And guys, uh, sisters, brothers, I want to tell you, we don't have time to bicker and fuss. I know there's so many you know, and I'm, and I'm not even going to go into the other scriptures on women right now because it's, it's not the point to bring, bring it out like that. But the point is, is to show you what the light, what true Hanukkah represented. It's a supernatural thing. It's Christ coming in a sealed vessel. And the only way that you will ever be able to receive that light yourself is you have to break up your own fallow ground. That fallow ground is the hardness of hearts. You know, there's a lot of evidence that Christ was for women, not against them. You know, even the things that we see happen all around us. First woman to bring the gospel message was, a, or first person to bring the gospel message of his resurrection was a woman. Hulda the prophetess in the time of the kings. The Levites had to go to her. The, the, the priest, one of the Levitical priests there, was commanded to go to, he, had, he went to her to consult the mind of God, and she had the mind of God. I know there's a lot of men that like to say, well, you know, well, you know, bless God, Jesus only chose 12 disciples, and therefore it's only supposed to be men that preach the gospel. If you want to be that technical, then you need to be Jewish men because he didn't choose 12 Gentile men. He chose 12 Jewish men. But you have to understand there's a reason why he chose 12 men. That light had not come as of yet, but he had more than 12 apostles. After his resurrection, he commissioned women as well to preach the gospel. Look at the woman at the well. Jesus witnessed to her about that well of water that would spring up with inside of her. 
He said, I give you water. You don't have to come here anymore. Once that water got to bubbling inside of that little lady there, you couldn't keep her quiet. She broke every commandment that they had as far as for, for, the, for the, not, not that, let me say commandment. When I say commandment, I'm not talking about biblical commandment because we see, we see too many women in the Bible that were given a voice to speak. You had Miriam, you had uh, Hulda, you have Esther, you have Ruth, you have so many out there. Deborah, king of Israel, led by God. Man wouldn't even go into battle without her being there because he knew that God was with her. They led Israel for 40 years. But you know what? As soon as the Vatican got a hold of it, and of course that church and state were united and it became an official way of doing their religion. That's where the Bible got birthed at. And many of the canons that should have been there were never put there. It's kind of hard for us to say for sure now. That's one reason why I really believe that God has sent two witnesses in the final days. That's why Jesus even says when they talk about Elijah, they ask him, doesn't the scripture say that Elias must first come? Jesus said, truly, he will come and he will restore all things. Now, some people say, well, Jesus is the one that restored all things. Yes, he did restore all things. But the problem is Jesus also knew that there would come another 2,000 years of man getting his little fingers a hold of God's word and trying to keep it from the people and take out this and take out that. You know, let me tell you something. The word of God says if you add one word to it or take one word from it, it'll be taken from your life or it'll be added. Read either which way you want to look at, God brings it upon you. You have, for a fact, for a fact, translators intentionally mistranslated scriptures based on the political agenda. I listened to a debate recently about the Sabbath, and one of the arguments that the guy brings up in there is that what they're calling the first day of the week where they meet on Sunday for their worship, they clearly brought it out that that word in Greek is sabbaton. It is a transliteration for the word Sabbath. They met on the first of one of the sabbaton, one of the Sabbaths. It's literally the plural form. First of the Sabbaths. I thought that was so interesting. Even when, even when you get into the fact that Paul, as his custom was, every Sabbath taught in the synagogues. You know, you just cannot hide God's word. But he does have to bring it back and restore it. And I want to tell you something. I know there's churches, even the Seventh-day Adventists, that say that, well, we restored the Sabbath. We're the only ones with the right thing. No, it is an individual walk. My brother and my sister, I speak to you and tell you, unless you yourself are willing to forsake father, mother, brother, sister, husband, wife, to follow him, you're not worthy. So, sister, you won't be spared either because you say, I'm serving God as I serve my wife. No. That's not the way Jesus does his work. He said you got to be willing to forsake him. If that's what it takes for you to do it, you have to forsake him. You become one with Christ. You become one with him. That life will live in you. Then you will be like it was in the very beginning. See, this is what Jesus came to do. When he came and brought back that life, when his side was pierced on Calvary, by the Roman soldier's sword and the water came out. He was showing that that water, that water of life, the waters of life, the life of God that was a tree of life in the Garden of Eden had been released, had been poured out. And that life, as John said, became the light of men. Not speaking, oh, let me see how dumb it is to even suggest. When it says the light of men, I mean, do you want to be so technical and say only men can get the Holy Ghost? You know better than that because on the day of Pentecost, there were both men and women in that upper room and they all received the Holy Ghost. Why does it say men? Because God is taking you back to the beginning when they were one. When they were one. So what is it? How do you become one now? Didn't Jesus say in that day you will know that I am in the Father, the Father is in me, and I am in you, and you are in me? That's how you become one. You become one with him. You stand alone with God for your salvation. And sister, you cannot, 
You cannot get saved by serving your husband and neither can the husband be saved by serving his wife or your church or anything else. You're saved by serving Christ. You're saved by believing upon him and the sacrifice that he gave in believing that that light is in you. And you know where some men try to say, you know, uh, they try to put women to such a low estate and they say, well, Paul said you shall be saved in childbearing. Let me just pull that up for you so you can see about this. Uh, that was the one I was thinking about earlier when I said I forgot and I wanted to bring this up to you. Oh, gosh, I'm not quite sure how to bring that up. Let me see. Uh, maybe that's considered one word. Yes, 1 Timothy 2.15, Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with all sobriety. <coughs> now, it says up here, But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in, uh, in childbearing if they... Uh, continue in faith and charity and holiness with all sobriety. That has been so mistranslated. Not even funny. To begin with, he never said saved. He actually says safe. You want to look it up. It's the original word is safe. S-A-F-E, safe, not saved. Safe in childbearing. What they were doing, he didn't say let the woman learn in silence with all sobriety. Hang on, just say it. I have to go back on this one here. Um, he didn't say, but I suffer not a woman to teach in order to serve. He said, I suffer not that woman to teach or to, or to serve any authority over a man. Now, you have to understand there again, as we talked about in another message, you're only seeing one side of the conversation here. Paul was getting letters written to him about situations that were going on. And the problem that they had there was the, was the goddess of Artemis there in that time period. And they were being taught that, that a woman, the only way that she could be uh, safe in childbearing is if, they're, if they went before the god of Artemis. And there, be, there came a woman into their, into their ranks there declaring that this had to be so. And, the, and you have to remember, under that particular culture and everything of that day, not only that, they also taught that women were enlightened and that man was in the transgression and it wasn't women and that women were greater than men. And believe me, this is not something we I support at all. I look at the equality between men and women according to the Word of God and the way it's actually written. But in this case here, Paul said, I suffer not that woman to teach her to serve any authority over man. But then he goes into showing you um, that she had, but, see, but, but the one that was being silenced was the woman coming in there teaching this heresy. But then he straightens out the issue because that also part of their doctrine was is that women were not to blame. It was the man to blame. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. They were actually saying that the woman was formed first and then the man. They were doing it in their doctrine just the opposite way around. Now, so then Paul, when he closes it, he doesn't say, notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing. Paul says, notwithstanding she shall be safe in childbearing. See, in other words, you don't have to follow all this nonsense and these gods and stuff. And these are where all the scruples and things come up in here, sister, brother, there. You know, I mean, there are so many people that they don't want to take the time to search these things out, but they're true. And they're things that, that you know, that, that need to be brought out. Um, but anyway, uh, we, we could go into a whole lot of things there. I'd love to share some of these things with you there, but I'll just see how well you handle this one here because I know it's pretty... Pretty, pretty deep in what we're talking about here. Plus, my voice is about to totally give out now. God bless you. I love you. Brothers, understand, I'm not here to try to upset you. You may have a different opinion on this. If you do, that's quite all right. 
Sisters, I'm not trying to scold you either, but I'm trying to get you to realize that your salvation is between you and God and you and Him alone. And brothers, if you're listening and you realize in your own heart that your wife has just as much right to that eternal life as you do and she must have it on her own and you've been guilty of trying to suppress her, I pray, I want to pray with you right now. If you will repent, let's re- we'll repent together. Let's just pray together in closing here. And as well for my sisters that God will deal with your own hearts. Heavenly Father, I pray thee, Lord God, forgive us, O oh God, in time past, Lord, where things we did not know about our sisters, that you forgive us, Lord. Forgive these brothers, Lord, that are willing to pray with me even now, Lord, that look down upon women, not knowing, maybe some of them not even doing it in their heart intentionally, Lord, just believe that they just take things for face face value, not knowing that there's been an agenda to keep women pressed down. And God's not trying to elevate them to a greater status, but we're sons and daughters of His. We're one in Christ. We're not two, we're one. As you said in your word, Lord, there's neither male nor female in him. So I pray, Father God, for my brothers, and I ask you, Lord, forgive them. Forgive me, Lord, if I've ever done anything to offend any sister, Lord, any woman, Lord, anybody, Lord, that I might, we might be clear and clean before you. And I pray this, Lord, in your precious name, in the name of Yeshua Mashiach. God bless you all. Hag Sameach. Happy Hanukkah. And God, God be with you. And we thank you for watching. Shalom.